Yossi Tsur, a bereaved father, no parent should ever, ever have to bury a child. In 2003, Yossi's son, Asaf, he was an 11th grade student, almost 17. He wasn't even at the age that he could go to the army. He was returning home from school and a Palestinian suicide bomber from a Hamas detonated a bomb on his bus. 17 people were killed, including nine school children. These aren't militants. These were innocent school children and civilians returning home from school that day. Yossi, Yossi is a 64 year old computer science engineer. He works for a software company. He's been married to Leia and he has four sons and grandchildren. He's lived in Haifa his entire life. But Yossi now is actively involved in helping bereaved families and organizations prevent further acts of terrorism and to protect victims of terrorism. So thank you, Yossi for being willing to share your story on such a painful day. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, having me and listening to the story. Uh, so you, you, you said, uh, you said the, uh, <clears throat> about uh, the attack in uh, Haifa. Um, I personally wasn't in Israel on that uh, day. I uh, used to travel a lot uh, in my work and uh, I went this that same morning, uh, I went to Germany and as I landed there, I started to get uh, those phone calls that uh, asked me, did you hear, did you hear? And uh, I, I said to the people, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm in Germany, I didn't hear anything, what's happened? And then finally, after a few calls, my son, who was a soldier at the time, called me and told me there was an attack in Haifa. and. Uh, and uh, we started to make uh, the telephones. I don't know if many people remember, but uh, 20 years ago, during the years 2000, 2001, 2003, uh, we were used to having uh, attacks daily in Israel. It's, it, was, it, was, uh, it was the suicide bombers who uh, came and uh, made their attacks in restaurants, in buses, in... Uh, in every places. And I told my son, uh, you know, like, please check everybody is okay. I didn't have, I didn't think about uh, the fact that, that Asaf might be there. But unfortunately, uh, we discovered that he uh, was. Uh, he was at school and uh, his uh, girlfriend at that time convinced him to stay at school until the end of the uh, day. And, and they went together to the uh, bus station. Uh, they boarded the bus, and uh, after a few station, uh, his girlfriend and a couple of others girls decided to go down or to, to leave the bus and go have uh, some lunch. They decided they uh, offered Asaf to come with them, uh, but he said, "No, I'm tired. I'm going home." And uh, they went off uh, the bus, and he remained uh, on the bus. After uh, after a few minutes, he heard, they heard the, uh, the, the the sound of the bombing, and uh, after uh, they went into uh, some uh, kiosk and saw it all on television. They they were the ones to call uh, my wife and to tell her, you know, Asaf was on the bus, and we know from the beginning where he sat in the bus and where he was in the bus. Um, those uh, terror attacks at that time, uh, they, 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 uh, the suicide bombers, the terrorists, uh, they came into Israel looking to kill uh, Israelis and, and, and Jews. Um, they didn't know who they are killing. And in the bus, among those 17 uh, people that were killed a day, there was uh, two Christians, one... Uh, one immigrants for the former Soviet Union, uh, one an American uh, girl who was 13 years old and his family lived in Haifa for many years. Uh, there was one Muslim uh, woman who was on her way to work. And there was one Druze girl 
who lived on the Druze villages uh, in the Calvin Mountain, and the rest uh, were Jews. So it's uh, like a spitting image of the uh, society in Israel, four religions, Jews, Druze, uh, Christians, and Muslims, and the attack was totally uh, blind, no, no targets. Uh, strangely enough, uh, we, we tend to think that uh, those terrorists, they come and they have a motive uh, against Israel, against something that was done to them or to their family. And the suicide bomber on this bus left uh, a letter which was found later on on, uh, on the bus, which says that he does this attack. Uh, one, for the glory of uh, Allah, he was an extreme Muslim. And the second is for the glory of the martyrs of 9-11. So no connection to Israel, purely, uh, purely an extreme Muslim who came to kill people uh, without any uh, connection uh, to Israel. And this was something that uh, drive, uh, drove me and drove others uh, to to investigate and to to understand why because you, you just can't live with this uh, feeling that uh, someone comes and and blows up a bus and kills seventeen people and really we couldn't understand the the, the motive. Uh, we then discovered uh, through uh, the uh, pub the public media that was published after the attack that the mother of the bomber. The mother of the uh, terrorist who, who exploded on the bus, uh, according to the uh, Muslim uh, customs, she was supposed to uh, welcome the people that uh, came to her house uh, to comfort her with black clothes and bitter coffee to express the grief. But uh, rather than uh, taking the uh, the customs that uh, that, uh, the normal customs, she decided to stay with her day-to-day uh, -day clothes and welcome everybody with sweets and, uh, and to celebrate uh, for three days uh, the death of her son. And it always strikes me that I will never be able to understand how a mother hates my child more than she loves her own. And this this was uh, something that uh, again drove us to to do things in order to prevent the next terror victim, and we are fighting uh, with whatever we can do uh, to to prevent terrorism. And we were involved in the uh, lawsuit against the Arab Bank, which took place in the states and now is continuing in Israel. We are uh, very active in the parliament in the Knesset of Israel in order to make new laws that will make a terrorists' uh, life harder. Uh, for example, to uh, um, every terrorist who gets paid for the terror attacks that he did from the Palestinian Authority is now, uh, we, can, we can expel him from, uh, from Israel, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, take his uh, citizenship or his uh, whatever papers he has to stay and to uh, send him uh, to elsewhere. Uh, we think it's very important. We think it's something that uh, must be done. And uh, on top of what the government and the army and the police and the security forces are doing, there is always need to initiate new things. And we are... Uh, we are active in, in that. I am active uh, in that. Uh, I'm also very active in commemoration. I think that uh, a person uh, stays with us or exists as long as he is uh, present in the minds and memories of uh, people. I like to uh, keep Asaf uh, with us as long as I can. Asaf was almost 17 years old, 11th grader, and a normal, a normal teenager. He loved his, uh, his friends and uh, going out with them. 
he loved music as loud as possible, and he loved surfing, uh, which the first thing of commemoration that we did was to create his tombstone as, uh, as a surfing board coming out from the uh, waves of the sea. Uh, but uh, later on, I took on uh, upon a few other uh, uh, campaigns to to bring him uh, the knowledge about him, uh, the, the 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 picture of him, the, whatever I could take out, and to send it to as many people as possible. Uh, at the time of the attack when Asaf died, I was uh, uh, going, uh, I was traveling a lot uh, for my work. And uh, I made it as a habit to come back always with a stone uh, from the places that I visited. And when I came back, I went to the cemetery and I have put the, the stone on the uh, on Asaf's grave. The uh, Jewish custom of uh, putting stones on uh, someone's grave when you come to visit is a, is a very old one. It has uh, quite a few sources. I, I held many reasons why we are doing that from the fact that uh, many years ago, uh, graves uh, were not covered with marble, but just a pile of stones and everyone who visited just fix it a little bit. And until those days where uh, it's actually uh, shows who is remembered and who is less remembered according to the number of stones that you see on one tombstone. What I did is I took, I wrote a letter to, to and sent it out to the internet saying that Asaf is unfortunately, uh, he was killed in a terror attack and he could not go out uh, to the world at the uh, age of 21, like every Israeli uh, young man does after the army service, takes his, uh, his backpack and goes to travel, to travel the world. I ask people, please send me a stone from wherever you are, and I will put those stones on the uh, tombstone of Osaf, bringing the world to him one stone at a time. And uh, it wasn't easy, and uh, it took some time, but a few weeks later, the house uh, started to get filled with packages. They piled up. I got uh, many packages. I was surprised to see not only that people send stones, they also send very touching uh, letters with stories. Uh, but eventually, at his 21 uh, birthday, I got around 2,500 uh, stones from around 75 countries. Every place people go and tour if that you can think of, I have a stone from there. Uh, some of them very touching stories. Uh, one girl that uh, was in the Berlin Wall and uh, took uh, out a few uh, pieces of the Berlin Wall with a hammer when it came down. She had it in uh, her drawer and then she said, uh, I'm sending it to you. I know where it should be. Another girl who planned a trip with her army friend and the army friend got sick and died, she went on the tour and brought back two stones. One she put on her friend uh, tombstone, and the second one she put in, a, in the drawer. And when she saw my letter, she said, okay, now I know why I kept the other one uh, in the drawer. I, am, uh, I must say I'm very proud about the fact that I managed to bring uh, so many stones from so many places. And I even have one which is dear to me because it came from outer space. Um, a former NASA engineer who uh, worked uh, on a famous meteorite that fell in Mexico in the 70s uh, had a few pieces of that uh, stone that fell from this from space in his uh, uh, in his house uh, after they finished uh, exploring that meteorite, and he sent me a small box with uh, those chips of the uh, meteorite that came from out of space. Uh, of course that the stones are uh, important, but uh, what was more important is the fact that uh, tens of thousands of people will uh, uh, go to the letter, heard about Asaf, heard about uh, his story, saw his uh, picture, saw the articles in the uh, media about him, and uh, I think 
that was uh, a successful commemoration uh, campaign uh, that I did uh, in his uh, memory. Uh, later on, after I got the stones, I thought it's not enough, so I started another one similar, but uh, I said, now that I've brought the world to, to Asaf, I want to send him on the trip to the world, and I made a small pamphlet with his picture and his story. I sent it out again on the internet and said, take it with you, and wherever you are, send me a photo of uh, him in that special place, and again, it was amazing to see I got thousands of uh, pictures from everywhere in the world. Uh, I took the best of the best of those, uh, around 50 uh, pictures, and made a small exhibition of it that uh, was presented in a couple of places. And it was very touching to see the uh, amount of creativity that people invested in getting me those, uh, those uh, photos. Both with the stones and the photos, I loved most the letters that I got back from people who said, you know, we went and toured and were uh, a few weeks uh, on the tour, but we always uh, was thinking about which is the best stone to bring or where is the best picture to take. And the fact that I managed to stuck uh, Asaf into their minds is, uh, is the success of uh, this uh, commemoration uh, story. Uh, one one thing that uh, I would like to to maybe uh, say there was a radio station in Israel that uh, did uh, last year and this year also uh, looking for funny stories from uh, from people who uh, who fallen by either uh, in the army or by terror attacks and I think this is something that uh, also. Uh, Present, uh, present those people who have fallen, not always by sad stories, but sometimes by by showing who they were and uh, how how they live their lives by telling those funny stories about them. I would like to share uh, one of those uh, stories with you uh, guys today. Um, many years ago, when Asaf was just nine years old, uh, we lived uh, for a period in uh, Brussels, in uh, Belgium, and uh, we went uh, on one of the weekends to uh, the Versailles Palace to visit the, the place. Uh, it was, like always, uh, packed with people, many tourists, many people, and uh, we stand uh, there in line until we got in. Uh, whoever visited the Versailles Palace knows that it's a tour of the palace going from the red room to the green room to the blue room to the yellow room and so on and so forth for I don't know how many tens of rooms. And uh, very quickly Asaf uh, lost the patience and uh, did not uh, want to stay with us and uh, go slowly from room to room. And he ran along and uh, went ahead of us. We continued the tour, going in line with all the other terrorists, uh, tourists. And then suddenly we saw there is a, there is a small uh, traffic jam <laughs> in front of us with a lot of people, many of them from Korea, from Japan, are taking pictures of, the, of one of the rooms like uh, they didn't do in any of the others. And when we got there, uh, we saw that, uh, of course, sorry, someone wanted to ask something? No, just continue. continue. Okay, sorry. So the, for in, in one of the rooms behind this rope that you are not supposed to cross on one of uh, Louis XIV couches, Asaf was lying, resting and waiting for us. Even... Uh, he said, what's happened? Why, why did it took you so long to get to me? We, of course, were very embarrassed, but we took him and went out and uh, let him play in the playground behind the uh, palace. So uh, this, uh, this was Asaf. He had a lot of charm. He had a lot of... Uh, he knew how to charm people and how to get uh, what he wanted uh, from them. No one uh, was able to be uh, mad at him or to uh, everybody just laughed and, uh, and, and, and were uh, happy with what he did. 
and uh, we we like to uh, remember him uh, also not uh, always as uh, it ended up but also as uh, we had him for uh, almost 17 years old this year uh, we are uh, we say that every year it's a, it's a roller coaster emotional roller coaster going from the holocaust day to the memorial day to the independence day this year Today, the 25th of April is Memorial Day. Tomorrow, we'll do the Independence Day. We'll go out. We'll be happy and we'll celebrate. On 27th of April is uh, Asaf's uh, birthday. It's the, his 37th uh, birthday. And this year, the roller coaster, the emotional roller coaster, is even worse or uh, deeper than uh, every other year, uh, but we'll remember him and uh, continue to remember him as as long as uh, we remember him, he is uh, alive and present with us. Wow, Yossi, thank you for sharing because- Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> there, are no, there, there are no words to comfort a bereaved parent, but if you don't mind, I would love to ask you a couple of questions. Um, you know, I think that it's so important that you're bringing awareness to this. And you know, one of the things you mentioned is this, the attack that your son died in, there were Druze and Muslims and Christians and Americans. And we've seen that recently with the terrorist attacks. There were children and there were American citizens and Italian tourists. And, um, you know, there seems to be like a perception out there in the media that like the terrorists are targeting settlers, but you know, you just proved to, and I think it's so important to raise awareness to the world that this is just indiscriminate terrorism. And one of the other things you mentioned was that this wasn't even against Israel. It wasn't even hate for Israel. And I wonder if that's affected your grieving process because sometimes when people have lost a loved one and it was like, defending the state of Israel because it was like an ideological, they fell because, you know, the person hated them for being Israeli, yet this seems that it was just like more random, probably in America, they would call it a lone wolf who was just out there with mental illness or something, you know, they somehow seem to always call those terrorist attacks. Do you think that in any way affected your perception of this attack or your ability to forgive and move on? Do you forgive? <laughs> well, uh, I, I do not forgive. Um, look, the, 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 the thing is that I don't think we need to convince the world because after 9-11 uh, and terror attacks in the uh, subway in London and in Spain and in Turkey, I mean, I think by now we know and uh, it's, it's, it's not that we... We think our, we ask ourselves, or we know for a fact that uh, the terror uh, hits everywhere, and uh, it's not just uh, an Israeli thing. Terror hits everywhere, and I'm, uh, I'm, I, I don't know if I want to to say it, but uh, there is opinions that we are deep into a religious war, which is worldwide. And we need to understand, because I emphasize the thing with the terrorists in Haifa, because we see in many cases that uh, the, the, the organization like Hamas, well, where can they find the next terrorist? And they find him inside the, the mosques, inside uh, the places where those extreme Muslims uh, exist. The terrorist who came to Haifa to, to, to explode on the bus, he was 21 years old guy from Hebron, from Hebron. He was a student in the Polytechnicum of uh, uh, Hebron learning uh, uh, computers. Everything indicated that he was uh, maybe a liberal or maybe someone who is far from religious, but that was not true. He was an extremist 
and and the fact that uh, that this is the what we are fighting with or against shows us and we know that that uh, we can't see any compromise or peace or whatever in the near future because the forces that we are fighting driven by Iran, driven by uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, driven by Hamas from Gaza, they are deep, very deep into uh, religion and into uh, religious war. And yeah, they hit without uh, uh, without a specific target. They don't care who they kill as long as, as they kill. And for that fact, uh, it's my belief that uh, we have to to fight it as hard as we can in order to uh, in order to provide to prevent the next uh, terror attacks uh, it's 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 a long way to go but uh, we have to do it and this is what uh, driving us look i have uh, i have four sons three of them are still alive and living uh, here in israel i have three grandchildren and i just cannot allow myself to be the same silent majority that I was before Asaf was killed. Because we, before that, we didn't uh, talk. We didn't do anything. We didn't demonstrate. We didn't initiate any activities. After Asaf was killed, we understand that it was this was uh, very bad on our side. So uh, we started to do that. And yeah, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's a it's, uh, it's something that uh, that uh, the world understand, I think, and it's 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 not it's not an Israeli thing anymore. It's not uh, it's not our problem anymore. It's it's more getting more and more a world problem, and uh, we are at the front, but uh, it's still uh, the whole world is uh, behind us. I think that just the fact that a mother can celebrate her child's death says so much about the religious war you're talking about, that there is so much of like an indoctrination. It like goes so against the instincts of a mother. And yet we see this played out over and over and not just on the Israeli stage, but everywhere. And that just says that there's so much you know, that hatred is coming from such a deep level. And as you say, it's a religious war at some level. Um, a question for you. You said like you lobby the Knesset and you work in to protect the, you know, to, to make sure this doesn't happen and the rights of victim. In America, if you lived there, you would go to your congressman mm -hmm. and you like, you know, you use your voice at a local level. How can people in Israel help make a change in this issue? Because it seems like as a parent, yes, this is your all-encompassing mission, but how do people on the street help um, lobby for change or make a difference to what's happening out there with terrorism? There are, a, there are quite a few, uh, there are quite a few organizations uh, that, uh, that lobby for for uh, for those issues. Uh, yeah, as a parent, I can go and do it myself. But even I, I uh, join uh, a forum of bereaved families, and together we are stronger than just uh, uh, one parent. Uh, there are other organizations uh, which uh, which uh, we work with in cooperation, or we do things together, or they do things on their own with uh, very various uh, genders. And I think that uh, every person in Israel wants to join and help and, and do something to, to make things better can uh, join and go through those organizations. Those organizations, by the way, they are also uh, having uh, all kinds of seminars to uh, make people, uh, you know, some people they take seminar how to talk to the media and the press. Some of them how to uh, how to work with with government, how to work with parliament, and uh, they they becoming very very effective. Uh, I'm I'm in connection with quite a few of those, and 
uh, I know organizations like uh, Im Tirzu or uh, organization like Israel Sheli, organization that that are actually supporting uh, those agendas and yeah they they need people to join they need people to to be involved and they need people to to help out to to apply the pressure because it's not something that a single person or a couple of people can do uh, it's it's getting uh, it's getting there it's getting more and more uh, with the new government we were uh, having high hopes uh, we managed to do a couple of things i i believe that in the coming months and uh, and if this government will last its four years, I think uh, we can do uh, more things because uh, we have uh, we have support amongst uh, the existing coalition.